Good morning and welcome to the WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver Teleconnection Session. Today, we have diversity in caregiving as part of a series, how to include caregivers in the care team or how caregivers can be included in the care team, a series for healthcare workers, but it's for all of you too. So I want to introduce our speakers. We're so fortunate to have, um, let's see, Elliot. Uh, um, Dr. Elliot Sklar is a public health professional with two decades of experience. Is it still two decades, Elliot? Okay. <laughs> In supporting the health of the public through academic work, research, and service. He has led healthy aging programs for seniors and for caregivers in Canada, Florida, and virtually, virtually around the world. Dr. Sklar is a professor of health science at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. He publishes and presents his work internationally, focused on the complexity of issues related to aging and caregiving, which you can find online if you look him up. It's a really cute picture. You should look him up. Lucy received her master's degree in social work from McGill University and has dedicated her career, her entire career, to supporting caregivers. Lucy was the founder and long-term manager of the Caregiver Support Center at a respite program for family caregivers in Canada. In 2003 and 2012, she received the Queen's Jubilee Award presented by the Canadian Home Care Association for her dedication in developing a national coalition to support caregivers. She's been a key architect of screening and assessment tools of family caregivers and, and provides training to professionals across North America. She would also, on a personal note, like you to know that she was a caregiver for her own mother for almost 10 years. And with that, Lucy and Elliot, we're so happy to have you. Thank you for joining us this morning for all the work you've put in here. Thank you so much. And thank you for that great introduction. Welcome, everyone. We're thrilled to have you here today. It's a very important topic, we think, um, certainly because the experiences of caregivers certainly differ based upon age, gender, sexuality, et cetera. So let's quickly review what we aim to cover in terms of our learning objectives today. We'll discuss the role of diversity in healthcare. We'll demonstrate basic knowledge of cultural competence and recognize differences in caregiver experiences based upon gender. We're also going to identify strategies for supporting diverse patients and caregivers. Now, if you'd like a certificate of attendance, you can certainly email uh, the contact information on this slide as well. So it might seem obvious to us um, what culture is, but uh, as a professor, I always like to set ground rules in my courses and have everyone um, you know, understand the same definition of something before we begin a discussion. So culture is defined as the major elements, uh, sorry, rather, the, the major elements of culture are symbols. Um, so these can be uh, artifacts, things like that, language, norms, values. And language makes effective social interaction possible. And it also influences how people conceive of concepts and objects. Now, culture, I think, is very much influenced by our upbringing. Uh, we might all identify as an example as uh, Americans, but we might not have all grown up with the same culture, the same traditions, customs, and that can relate to holidays. It can also relate to how we view healthcare. So caregivers are a very, very diverse population, um, and we I, I'm really looking forward, hopefully next year it will be published what the 2025 AARP report is. But the most recent data that we have is from the 2020 report, Caregiving in the US. And certainly I think that the COVID pandemic has changed some of the statistics as well. We also know that a number of caregivers don't self-identify based upon, for example, their gender or their cultural identity. So what we do know uh, from the report is still that caregivers are extremely diverse as a group. 39% uh, of caregivers, in fact, identify as culturally diverse, with 
17% of caregivers report being Hispanic or Latino. 14% of caregivers reported being non-Hispanic, African-American, or Black. And 5% of caregivers reported being Asian American or Pacific Islander. 3% of caregivers reported being an, uh, a different multi-race or ethnicity. Interestingly as well, 11% of caregivers were students enrolled in college or other courses. 9% of caregivers were actively serving in the US Armed Forces. And 8% of those caregivers also identified as being part of the LGBTQ plus community. Now, we want to point out as well, like I said, that the data has some issues. We know that there is underreporting. Um, many caregivers don't self-identify, um, but this is a national sample, much like a census is. And though it's from 2020, it doesn't necessarily reflect the effects of the pandemic. Still, I think that the data is very insightful, um, and it is consistent with some newer research as well. The age of the care recipient was something that really varied very much by the caregiver's race and ethnicity, where white caregivers were caring for older recipients on average about 71 years of age. And this is older than either African-American caregivers who were on average caring for someone about 65 years old or Hispanic caregivers who were caring for someone about 66.9 years old on average. Asian American caregivers were caring for someone around 69 years old on average, which is older than African American caregiver recipients, just as an example. Now, this data is also representative of many health inequities that exist across our society. For example, the life expectancy in the US of white people is older than it is for African American or black people. And the differences in life expectancy are greater the older the person is. So that's to say, for example, if you were born in 1950, there's a greater difference in the life expectancy by race and ethnicity than if you were born in 1990. So this is very interesting because it will also influence future trends that we'll see among caregiving in our country. Now, this data was averaged from a collection across the country, but we also know that there are concentrations of different types of caregiver race and ethnicities in different parts of the United States. As an example, we know that LGBTQ caregivers become caregivers at a rate that is slightly higher than their non-LGBT or heterosexual counterparts. Roughly one in five uh, uh, LGBTQ plus adults become caregivers as compared to roughly one in six heterosexual adults. So it's interesting that in certain cultures, caring for others, especially family members or chosen family um, can be very different. It can be considered an expectation or part of a normal family responsibility. Now there's also a lot of diversity among caregivers based upon religion. But interestingly, this isn't something that there's a lot of research that touches upon. Um, and yet current caregiver support programs, interestingly, if you look at the history of them, they're tied very much to our religious communities. Uh, old age homes, as they were known, used to be connected in fact with religion. So diversity certainly matters as it relates to caregiving. Now, just as our population is becoming more diverse, so are our seniors and caregivers. And I find this to be so interesting and I welcome all of you to do this. Um, take a, a quick look on Google under images and search the term family caregiver and see what images come up um, because you'll find that most caregivers are depicted as white women and most healthcare workers supporting seniors and caregivers are depicted as women of color. Now the common depictions of caregivers and outreach efforts to the caregiving population have not caught up with the diversity of caregiver reality in our country. So why is this important? Just as an example, if you're a man and you're a caregiver, many caregiver support programs use photos of women to advertise to. So if you don't see yourself represented, you may feel like that support program just isn't for you. 
Now, when it's also uh, some recent research um, that was very interesting as it relates to medical care, found that African-American and Hispanic caregivers reported feeling invisible. And that's a very important word. That was their word, invisible in medical facilities. Now, caregivers know their partner's medical history, their symptoms, their needs. So when there are communication breakdowns with medical providers, that can really result in poor response or dismissal of caregivers' input. And what will happen is that patients are inevitably bound to suffer. Now, there's also a lot of research that supports the notion that caregiver experience varies by race, ethnicity, age, and gender. Specifically, that these factors may play a role in how caregivers perceive the intensity of their caregiving stressors, their available resources, and coping strategies. Sorry that my mouth is a little bit dry. I had my wisdom teeth removed last week and I'm still getting used to it. So I do apologize. My speech is a little bit impacted. Um, so for those who work professionally with caregivers, we wanted to provide some important tips um, that we thought were important because cultural sensitivity is key. So we are so appreciative for those of you participating and watching this. Trainings like this are so important because they remind us of how to reduce presumptions and misconceptions about others' experiences, and also to ensure that we're doing the best for our diverse caregivers and their care partners. Caregivers are diverse, and they need to be supported in a very inclusive manner. So how do we do this? First and foremost, by recognizing that caregivers' life experiences and experiences with healthcare may differ based upon their age, their race, their gender or sexual identity, et cetera. So as a result, what can we do? We can find points of commonality and relation. So we can ask questions, you know, for example, uh, it's autumn in many parts of the country right now. You know, we can talk about how the weather is. Are you enjoying the change of season? Is that soup that I smell that you have on? If it's getting colder? things like that. It's also important for healthcare workers to familiarize themselves with local resources for culturally diverse caregivers. So many temples and churches, community centers, and other nonprofit organizations have resources. You can spend a few minutes on Google, or you can call 211 or provide those resources to the people with whom you're working. They can be amazing as referral mechanisms to help connect people to resources that are also culturally sensitive. And you can ask caregivers to teach you and educate you about their own traditions and cultures. It's one of the best ways to show an interest and a respect and appreciation for the culture and background of a caregiver. So um, I see that we have oh, some chats and uh, they were related to the certificate of attendance, not to our content. Um, but it is a good time to just quickly ask if anyone has any questions or wants to add anything uh, about anything that I've had to say so far. Well, I want to thank you, Elliot. <laughs> I think there was a lot of good information. <clears throat> Person. And I would add, you know, I think sometimes the other cultures, other cultures than white people who have become, you know, sort of familiarized with the word caregiver, people don't see themselves as caregivers. It's just their family duty. And the term caregiver differs in other cultures as well. Um, and we've learned that from, from professional experience, personal experience. So we have to use other terminology, other language um, when we're reaching out to people. Um, sometimes asking, do you help with, um, you know, or who helps you with? Things like that can also be telling in identifying who that caregiver might be. Okay, that's, you know, I just want to share something. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, back home where I'm from, Montreal, Canada, there's a new terminology being used now for caregivers. They're, they're called care partners. Something to think about. It's a little bit different. Okay, before I start, I'd just like to ask a question, and I hope that you respond to that. 
does the gender of a caregiver matter? Do you think it matters? This is your chance, folks. Lucy, uh, I think you're muted. I think it's uh, uh, Dondi. If you want, I think you wanted to say something, but you're muted. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> well, regardless of um, what I want to say is the gender of a caregiver does really matter. And though our intention might be to feel that it doesn't, it really does. Within our complex system of long-term care, women's caregiving is essential in providing a backbone of support. In fact, the value of informal care that women provide, believe it or not, ranges from 148 billion to 188 billion annually. Women provide the majority of informal care to spouses, parents, parents-in-law, friends, neighbors and they uh, you know they play many roles while caregiving um especially at providing um health care hands-on health care they can be case managers companions surrogate decision makers and advocates many studies have looked at the role of women and family caregiving although not all have addressed gender issues and caregiving specifically the results are still women. Uh, be, it's, it's really the majority are women because they are the majority of informal care providers in this country. Caregiving poses greater financial challenges for many women workers, due mostly to the lost wages for reduced work hours, time out of the workplace, family leave, and even early retirement. According to the 2020 Caregiving in the US report, Women are more often caring for two or more adults, 27% versus 20% for men caregivers. A greater proportion of caregivers report caring for a man, 39%, um, is higher than it was in uh, 2015, which at the time was only 35%. 41% of caregivers who have been providing care for five years or longer uh, more often report caring for a man. 43% of caregivers of baby boomers are caring for a man. I, it, that has increased since uh, 2015 uh, uh, to 33%. Now, other studies found that men respond to caregiving responsibilities in a fundamentally different way. Women uh, tend to stay home to provide uh, time-consuming care to one or more ill or disabled friend or family members, while men respond to loved ones need by support, by delaying retirement so they work longer and power, you know, to shoulder the financial burden associated with long-term care. The impact of women caregiving can be very, very overwhelming. So I also wanna tell you that, <clears throat> excuse me, one in five female caregivers aged 18 to 39 said that stress was nearly always present in their lives. Nearly twice as many as those who were not caregivers for male caregivers. The negative impact on caregivers' relationship and social network due to their reduced ability to participate in activities outside their caring role can lead to caregivers experiencing social isolation. And we know that caregivers do isolate themselves, which in turn can impact on their psych a psychological well being. Studies have demonstrated that women are more vulnerable than men to the effect of reduced social support. The physical impact of providing care can lead to long term care needs for female caregivers. For example, a national survey found that 21% of female caregivers had mammograms less often, so they're not really taking care of their own health. 25% of women caregivers have health problems as a result of their caregiving uh, activities. Coronary heart disease, CHD, is one physical risk factor of caregiving. Women who spend nine or more hours a week caring for an ill or disabled spouse increase their CHD risk twofold. 
Other health effects, including elevated blood pressure and increased risk of developing hypertension, lower perceived health status, poorer immune function, slower wound healing, and an increased risk of mortality. So that's a lot to think about. Frequently, support services can make a real difference in the day-to-day -day lives of caregivers. Research has shown, for example, that counseling and support groups in combination with respite and other services have positive direct effects on health behavior practices and assist caregivers in remaining in their caregiving role longer with less stress and greater satisfaction. So as healthcare workers, we can really have a huge impact by recognizing their needs and supporting them in services that really help them. In fact, women are more than twice as likely as men to say that they would benefit from talking to someone about their caregiving experience. Further, some studies have shown that actual linkage to services in lieu of information only programs are more beneficial to caregivers. Very much what we're doing now, the Well Met Charitable Foundation Caregiver Telecognition is a great example of this, where participants can share their experience and learn from other caregivers as well. So as a healthcare worker, uh, keep that in mind that caregivers do need, they do want to be listened to and support group and information sessions like ours are extremely beneficial. So before we continue, I wanted to ask if anyone had any additional tips that they wanted to share or strategies that have been helpful in supporting female caregivers. Okay. Well, Lucy asked a great question earlier. Does the gender of a caregiver matter? And I say, yes, it does. And my reason is a little bit different. But if you think about those Google images that I talked about, um, if you're a male caregiver and you don't see programs in your community that display male caregivers or whose advertising, as an example, for support services might be in pink, um, men may not identify with that. A lot of caregiver programs, and if you Google image caregiver support or caregiver program, you'll find many of them are actually designed to attract um, women. That can be a great thing, but it can also be very isolating. So the gender of a caregiver does matter because if you're a male caregiver, you may not find that you have as many resources that you feel are as welcoming or catering to you. So while the role of women as caregivers may have been true for a lot of history, gender roles are changing and intergenerational dynamics are also shifting. So even though those are happening, we still continue to associate caregiving with a gender and that's a feminine role. And doing that can create a lot of harm. Before and after the pandemic, Men have in fact been significant providers of care related work, both within families and careers. So it's important to highlight and recognize that um, men have been you know, in supportive or caregiving roles at certain points, uh, especially during the pandemic. And for many male caregivers who might feel like caregiving is completely new to them, uh, many of us became caregivers even for someone's mental health during the pandemic. So it's a good reminder uh, to people to lean on strategies we may have used in the past. Peer support is also critical for male caregivers. They're less likely to seek out support and more likely to need it. So what can we do as healthcare workers? We can minimize bias. We can affirm the role of male caregivers. We can remind male caregivers of strategies, like I just said, that they may have used previously. Uh, we can identify resources. Um, and as well, there are many online and virtual support groups too. It's also important that we're a little bit more strategic. There's a lot of research, but also professional experience from input that we've received during these programs um, in years past and with other healthcare workers that male caregivers are more reluctant to access health services. 
And they perceived that they should manage their own uh, stress, their own issues related to caregiving. Um, and if they did request formal assistance, it was to address concerns related to their care recipient rather than to their own needs. So that's something that we can use to harness in a positive way. We can suggest uh, that male caregivers seek support care and services and respite um, to better help their care recipient, not so much for them. And using that as a strategy can be very helpful. It's worked with many male caregivers um, to get them to accept uh, respite care or in-home care as an example. So it's an important strategy for people to consider as well. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about LGBTQIA plus caregivers. Um, we're gonna use the shorter acronym LGBT um, or LGBT plus, but we'll first you know, explain what all of that means, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer or questioning, intersex and asexual and or ally. There are other definitions as well. The reason for our inclusion of sexual identity in our discussion today um, is, as we mentioned earlier, LGBT adults become caregivers at a higher rate than their heterosexual peers. And for many LGBT community members, long-term care options can feel especially challenging. This is a very important hot topic issue right now. Thank you for that, Elliot. You know, it's interesting that Informal unpaid caregivers of chronically ill adults is far more common among LGBT individuals than non-LGBT adults. And stronger support systems for LGBT caregivers are really needed, particularly for those who are giving care to a friend and, uh, and not to a partner or a biological family member. LGBT adults become care caregivers at a slightly higher rate than their non-LGBT peers, as Elliot was reporting. In a recent survey of LGBT baby boomers found that a growing number of aging adults expect to be treated with respect and dignity at the end of their life. In spite of this, one in five LGBT adults surveyed cited fear of double discrimination for being older and being an LGBT member as a significant concern about their aging. So you could just imagine how difficult that could be. These fears are particularly important for seniors moving into nursing homes or residential care facilities, which will, you know, I'm going to speak a little bit later about this particular issue. So many LGBT people form strong family of choice in addition to their families of origin as a way of coping with possibly or actually rejection from parents, siblings, and other relatives for being open about their sexual orientation or gender identity. Even as attitudes have changed and LGBT people have become more visible and accepted, families of choice still provide valuable networks of emotional and social support. Nearly two thirds of LGBT older adults say they consider their friends to be chosen family. Being a member of both a chosen family and a family of origin creates situations where an LGBT person may become a primary caregiver for a spouse, domestic partner, or a legal spouse, a close friend who is also LGBT, LGBT or an aging parent or other related relative, sometimes at the same time. So you could just imagine. In the community at large, it is most common for informal caregivers such as spouses and adult children to provide the majority of care to older adults in the United States. In the LGBT community, with older adults twice as likely to be single and living alone, and three to four times less likely to have children, a family of choice is dependent upon to provide support and care. So LGBT adults are less likely to have children. Keep that in mind when you are you know, interviewing or providing care, who are our main source of family caregiving. LGBT caregivers are younger, less likely to be married, more racially and, and, and ethnically diverse, 
and more likely to be of low socioeconomic status than the non-LGBT caregivers. Research has already shown that the minorities and those of lower socioeconomic status are less likely to access and utilize resources and community um, support. The LGBT community and you know it's it's wide range of individuals with separate and overlapping uh, challenges. Other uh, identity factors include race and economic status can affect the quality of care they receive or their ability to access care. So it's really important to ask the right questions. We don't want to lump people all together, even that you know it's a very diverse community with different difficulties that each one um, could face. So just being educated about the community and the diversity is also extremely important. I also wanted to just add that a lot of the trends that we see among LGBT plus caregivers um, that you mentioned, um, being single more often, being less likely to have children or fewer children, um, being younger and more ethnically or racially diverse. These are trends that we're seeing across the board among caregivers in the United States. And I think that a lot of the challenges faced by the LGBT community that we have spent a long time researching and discussing um, are um, going to be things that we see more widespread across the, the overall caregiver population. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, we talk a lot now in healthcare about um, trauma-informed care, which really means understanding the unique experiences that an individual may have had um, with their own life experiences, or uh, also their experiences with healthcare. Um, these can be very important in overcoming obstacles and challenges when working with people um, in terms of compliance, in terms of getting them to, um, to communicate and trust uh, in the care that you're providing and the expertise that you're providing as well. Now, older LGBT adults have a very unique experience with healthcare. Um, they're really the first generation of out seniors that we're seeing. So as a healthcare system, we're all learning in the process how to be more inclusive and more sensitive. And it is indeed a process. Now, part of that is learning about the history and the experience of trauma related to identity. If you think about it, it wasn't until 1973 that the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from the second edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. So let's say that you're working with someone now who was born in 1950. Well, they were 23 when the APA removed that diagnosis of homosexuality. They were a young adult. They were 19 when Stonewall occurred, which was the first time a gay bar in New York was raided and the patrons actually fought back. And that was the movement that began the, the pride movement as we know it today. So these life course experiences, whoops, sorry, were very important, um, you know, certainly in understanding uh, how individuals may feel about healthcare and their own life experiences um, or things that may affect their role as a caregiver. One of them, including marriage. So that same individual would have been 65 years old when gay marriage became federally legal in the United States. So imagine living to be 65 and never being able to get married to obtain the legal benefits of marriage, which include the Family Medical Leave Act, something very important for caregivers who provide care for a spouse. Many older uh, couples as a result, did not get married when gay marriage became legal because they thought, you know, we've lived our lives this whole way, what does it matter? But as you continue to age, things like FMLA are very important. Now that person born in 1950 would be 74 today. So think of what that life experience might, might feel like. LGBT older adults are five times less likely to seek medical care and social services than the general public. 
These experiences can lead to a fear of disclosing sexual orientation or gender identity in healthcare settings due to potential discrimination or provider bias. And there's another thing called internalized homonegativity. And that's what we call the effect of homophobia in our society <clears throat> turned inward. So many older adults have some level of discomfort with their own sexuality because of how society has treated them. That can result in trauma, challenges with intimate relationships, and even sometimes mental and physical health consequences. But again, these experiences can also lead to a fear of disclosing sexual orientation or gender identity. So as healthcare workers, professionals, and even educators, we constantly should be evaluating our own attitudes and values. And that also means assessing our knowledge, our skills, our attributes that we might need to work more comfortably in cross-cultural situations. Now, it might be hard for some of us to separate our inherent biases, religious, or even political beliefs right now when serving the healthcare of others. All the more reason why it's important to connect cultural sensitivity to our professional values and our respective helping fields. I've been asked before um, recently how to handle um, employees in healthcare situations who seem insensitive to others' cultures or gender or sexual identities. And I like to remind people of two different things. The first is our professional oaths. I'm lucky that I get to attend a graduation ceremony every year at my university. Um, and I am reminded because everyone recites those professional oaths that we're here in our given health professions to serve the good and the health care of others. Um, it's a good reminder of what it is that we do. So for example, the path of oath that social workers take says to treat all people with dignity and respect regardless of the differences, to end discrimination, oppression, poverty, and other social injustices. Now, the other thing I like to remind people of is that diseases don't discriminate. We learned that certainly during the pandemic, and we shouldn't discriminate either when we're treating them and the people that they afflict. Um, and in some communities, there's a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's and dementia. We know that to be true among Hispanics, among African-American and Black individuals, and also among members of the LGBT community. So we have a greater likelihood to be serving caregivers from these communities. And again, if you look at those Google images and you think about it, why are we not seeing that representation of what the real diversity is of caregivers' experiences? It's an important question for all of us to think about. And I wanted to ask if anyone has any comments or questions before we continue. If you're on the phone, please press star six, and I have a little website where I can see that you've done that. We would love to hear from you, and it, you know how to do it if you're on Zoom. You can go to the chat room, put mm -hmm. your hand up, Just unmute yourself. It's interesting what the social worker oath is and what it includes. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, during the course of our work, we don't often think back to what it is that we recited as our professional oath. Yes, I mean, you know, it, it's, we wear so many different hats when we work in the healthcare system. And I always say, you know, your private life, you wear one hat, but when you are with a client or a patient, you better put on your professional hat, which then reminds us that we all have our biases, but I don't think we, we have the luxury of doing that when we're a professional. We have to really look at the person for who they are and not uh, make any judgments prior to knowing what the needs are. It's, it's very interesting. It, it, you know, there is really strong evidence that training for healthcare professionals about diversity and proof providers' knowledge and understanding and skills for treating patients from culturally, logistic, and socioeconomic diverse backgrounds. Um, so it's so important for us to educate ourselves. And I have to tell you, um, even doing this session, just a research that 
uh, we both did uh, opens our eyes for all of us. I mean, it's it's a constant learning process that we have to go through. And I think you owe it to yourselves and to the people you're serving to really understand uh, where these people are coming from, what are their uh, backgrounds and their uh, knowledge. So there is a reported increased patient satisfaction and improved health outcomes with the clinically significant improvements when we as healthcare workers are sensitive and educate ourselves to the diverse communities. We know this is especially true when it comes to long-term care and long-term planning. And sometimes, unfortunately, placement in long-term care sometimes comes down to availability of a bed and having means to pay for it. We've been facilitating sessions for LGBT seniors and caregivers on how to find culturally competent long-term care and the importance of finding a facility in which people feel, quote, on, in, you know, at home with regard to their culture or religion is so important because at the end of the day, this is their last stop. So you wanna make sure that they're comfortable in that and that they are seen, you know? Um, I know one friend said to me, as I'm aging, I'm starting to be become invisible. Like I'm not being looked at as much as I was before. And I want to also talk about faith-based and culturally focused community groups and agencies can be very helpful in identifying culturally sensitive long-term care support in a variety of communities. Familiar things like language is important. Keep that in mind. Food is extremely important. Celebration around traditions or holidays are all linked to a patient satisfaction and improve health outcomes, which impact both the patient and caregivers supporting them. Training like this one is important to sensitize healthcare workers to ways in which we show our patients and their caregivers that we appreciate who they are and where they're coming from. There are also many, um, you know, there are many uh, resources um, for tools and information and things like that. There are games that you can play with colleagues to enhance cultural sensitivity and understanding. Um, so if you're working in a place with all kinds of different people from diverse cultures, get to know them. Have I think, Elliot, you talk about potluck lunches, right? that people uh, bring food from their own cultures, recognizing that, and just being sensitive in general, especially in the climate that we are all living in right now, to really be sensitive about other people and their needs. All excellent points. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? We yes. always learn so much from all of you. We'd love to have you talk to us. Share with us. What do you think? <laughs> While you're thinking about it, two things that come to mind recently um, that I've experienced here in South Florida. Um, <clears throat> I sit on a, a board of a long-term care facility um, in senior housing community. And... Um, there was a community member who said to me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to need at some point to go into nursing care or long-term care, but I can't, I'm gay. And, you know, it really struck me this, this man must have been around 80. So when I was speaking earlier about the life experience of someone, uh, for them to still feel uh, that they might not be welcome uh, at a potential healthcare facility, what a horrible thing to feel. Um, and again, why it's so important for us to be sensitive to the concerns. For example, when working with someone like that, if they um, might not feel open to disclose their sexuality or their reason why they may not wanna go into long-term care, it can be especially important to have uh, supports in the community to help that person age in place as long as they're able to. So it's one example of something that recently, you know, came to me. Um, and another is um, someone who was recently placed in long-term care 
um, and this is a, a parent of a colleague of mine um, who really didn't like the food. And the food was a really big challenge because um, her mom stopped eating. Um, and, you know, we know how important nutrition is, right? So she started bringing her mom food and, um, and that was helpful, but it was a big burden upon her to do that um, in addition to working full time. Um, and the, the facility was not so close to where she lived. And what, um, what came to be the solution was they wound up changing her mom's meals to kosher meals. Now they were never kosher, um, culturally they identified as Jewish, um, but the, the kosher meals had food that were culturally more what her mom was used to eating. And that was the magic fix. Um, but it took several weeks and a couple of social workers to figure that problem out. Um, and so sometimes the solutions are not as obvious as we may initially think. Um, and Cynthia said also language barriers as illness progresses for some individuals, they return to their first language if it was not English. That's excellent. That's a really great point. Um, that's very, very true. And uh, again, why these are important things to consider. You know, I think many caregivers um, and healthcare workers learn that you need to be a, a jack of all trades, sort of a, a problem solver, a MacGyver, if you will. Um, and, and you need a skill set. So these are all things that we've learned from others and over the years um, that can help one another in helping others. And language, apart from what was said, the other thing about language that is so important is that the person that you're dealing with may not understand English. And an assumption can be made, oh, they must be really, you know, they have dementia. Um, or, or look at it in that perspective. Really being sensitive to that <clears throat> and going out of the way to recognize what language that person does speak and maybe have someone trying to get in someone who can understand and really meet the need of the individual. It takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of time, but it's all worth it in the end because we're talking about human beings. How would we want to be treated? I am already old, but I can get older. <laughs> how will you know? How will we all be treated when we are um, in a position where we need support and help? So I always keep that in mind, um, and I think it is important to really uh, think about that rather than just assume that someone must have dementia just because they're not responding to us. They might just not understand. That would be hard of hearing. Absolutely. 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 Poor eyesight. Who knows? There's yeah. many, many reasons. So we always love to leave you with uh, a, a number of resources um, for you to consult with if you'd like to learn more about some of the things that we discussed today. Um, 988 is a mental health hotline that I always speak about because I think it's a great, easy resource to give to your potential clients. Uh, we all have times of crisis, especially caregivers, where we need to vent or speak with someone. Um, we'll also be sharing information for the uh, WellMed Charitable Foundation in just a moment um, and their uh, number to support caregivers. But if you're looking for some of those uh, local resources in your community, 211 is a great resource directory so that you can find some tailored resources to share with your clients um, that may support them in their respective communities uh, or backgrounds. Um, now we have information here as well for Sage Care um, and their list of long-term care facilities that have been trained and credentialed by them. If you are looking for placement for an older LGBT adult and are looking for resources, it's an important one. There is also a diverse elders coalition that has a lot of great resources to, say, to support diverse caregivers. Uh, and finally, the Georgetown University National Center for Cultural Competence, whose website can be found at the bottom of our screen, has great resources and those games that Lucy was talking about to do at work, um, like cultural potlucks, but also um, even just uh, sharing information or questions 
about your different backgrounds, um, cultures, or countries that you may have come from. Um, so these are some great resources that we hope that will be of use for you and those that you serve. Um, the Wellman Charitable Foundation can be found uh, through all of the um, contact information that you see here. There's also um, the YouTube channel, which has all of the recorded programs um, from the teleconnection. And I will turn it over now to Evelyn to share some information about upcoming programs. And you all can see that the session survey is up. So please um, take care of that for us. We'd really appreciate it. When Elliot talked about the podcast, I want to remind you all, it's not just the last, what, three or four years, but it's oh, maybe eight years that we have put podcasts on www.caregivertelleconnection.org. And lately they're on YouTube, but there is a treasury uh, information for caregivers, people who work with caregivers in, a, a, in every topic, all by experts in their field. So I really recommend that you folks go on there, take a look at that. And what you'll find out is that if you're not registered today, you will not get the slides from Lucy and Elliot. So I encourage you all to call our customer service representative if you're not registered. Some people get the link from somebody else or a phone number from somebody else. But if you register, you'll not only um, get the link for the resources for the slides, but you will also get the monthly calendar so that you can easily register for anything in the future. And let's see, I've got some upcoming sessions I wanted to tell you about. Minerva, I'm going to need help with one of them. Um, the first one is Tuesday, November 5th, Ask Dr. Tam Questions. That's extremely popular because basically she opens up her line and she is an expert in Alzheimer's. So if you have any questions about your Alzheimer's uh, loved one or the person you're caring for, please log into that. Minerva, on November 6th, Wednesday, I'm sorry, I can't translate this. Can you tell folks what it's about if you're there? It is going to be regarding le legal issues for the caregivers to know from a licensed lawyer, and it's going to be in Spanish. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And then on Monday, November 11th, We've got uh, Caregiving in the Holidays, Practical Tips for Thriving, which isn't easy when you're trying to do the holidays the way you always did, and now you've got caregiving added to, to the burden, basically. And then on November 21st, we've got the last one. We have just a couple of this month. What you need to know about medications, the benefits and risk for seniors and caregivers with our dear Lucy. And that's always a well-participated one because it's always a question, you know, about those medications, you know, what's safe, what's not safe, what to do with them when they're, you know, out of, out of time, all of those kinds of questions, she answers them all for you. So please join us. We would love that. And at that, I would say to all of you, thank you so much for joining us today. We feel so lucky when folks you know, call in when they participate with us, when they share, when they, you know, just, you know, hear what's going on in the world and they can go out and share it with their friends and other caregivers. It means so much. So I appreciate you all and what you do every day. I want to thank, of course, Lucy and Elliot for all of the work they put into these presentations and for their beautiful actual presentation itself. And I'd like to thank the WellMed Charitable Foundation for all that they do for caregivers in many ways, in clinics, in the SOS, um, in, in trainings. You know, it's just, it's been so wonderful. And they've been doing it now for, oh, at least I don't know, 12, 13 years that I know about. And they've done a darn good job as far as I can tell. So thank you all for your um, participation today. And we hope to see you next month um and happy halloween <laughs> thank you thanks. all so much thanks it's been a pleasure please take care of yourselves yes 
Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye.